Hi there, it's Z here. In today's video, we're going to be talking about Monte Carlo simulations and how you can use this to develop probabilistic risk estimates. And uh, we'll be doing this with a tool called Excel Risk. Uh, it's a Excel add-in. Uh, to be fair, there are other tools available out there, uh, like At Risk by Palisade and a couple of others. Uh, but this is a nice one to use because it's free and open source. Um, you can also do this in Python if you're so inclined, uh, but since the purpose of this video is to give you an overview of the concepts, uh, uh, we'll stick with Excel RIS. Uh, this video is accompanied by a much more detailed um, article on Medium. Uh, I do suggest you have a look through because uh, this video will uh, not go through the theory so much and just sort of jump straight into uh, the mechanics of uh, how to use the tool. Um, and a link to the um, Excel model is available in the article if you want to sort of download it and follow along uh, for yourself. So, uh, without further ado, let's uh, cut to the example. So, say, uh, if you're watching this in 2020, uh, you're probably uh, working from home these days, and uh, I thought it would be a fitting example to uh, use the uh, vacation budget planning as uh, our work um, example for the uh, this this particular video so say that uh, you want to plan uh, a budget to visit uh, fantasy island uh, a holiday destination of your dreams where the sun always shines uh, and the sights are amazing although i do suggest you avoid uh, white water rafting uh, when you get there um, and so you're faced with the problem of uh, how much do I uh, plan for if I'm going to be there for five days. So um, a first attempt could be something as simple as uh, just breaking up a cost into different line items uh, and trying to make a best estimate. Uh, and hopefully the best estimate is supported by some research and uh, backing data. So it could be... Um, a survey that you've just done online where you googled uh, a couple of websites for prices on uh, plane tickets and hotel costs and uh, you're just putting in a number uh, and you get total and uh, doing it this way you get 4.2 thousand and that, that sort of works uh, the drawback of uh, this approach is you're not making full use of uh, all the information that you have because uh, when you did your sort of online survey, you didn't just have uh, one quote uh, for pricing. You you have a range for you know how much it costs for a, a fast food burger to you know, a, a fancy uh, sit down meal uh, and a cost between um, a swanky hotel and uh, an Airbnb. So uh, you could improve upon this by uh, adding in a high and low estimate. Uh, where it's basically the same approach, except now you have uh, the lowest number and the highest number. Um, and you now have sort of a, a min, a max, and also a number in between. Now, uh, this is a bit of an improvement, but you still have a, a small problem where, say for example, you want to set aside some money uh, for this budget. Um, now, you also want to be conservative because uh, you once you set aside the budget, you don't want to keep on trying to increase it. So you want to include some form of uh, contingency, let's just say. Uh, one approach is that you could pick a number between the max number and the middle number and be done with it, saying, well, that's not the middle number, it's more on the high side. Uh, and we'll just lock that in and uh, work through the numbers later. But uh, if you are in... Uh, a large organization and say you have uh, not a holiday budget but you're planning for uh, a project and the project could be in the order of uh, millions and you have a number of these different projects you need a more structured process uh, to allocate uh, your contingencies uh, and allowances for budget planning so you may want to get a bit more specific and say well i need a number where uh, 80 percent of the time uh, i will never exceed that uh, estimate so uh, you can't do that with the uh, approach that we've taken so far and this is why uh, 
probabilistic estimating um, comes in handy. So the way it works is um, after you've installed Excelris, uh, which you can do by uh, going to the Excelris page and clicking download install, you get this tab. And this tab will allow you to use uh, new formulas uh, that reflect uh, probability distributions. Again, read the Medium article if you want more detail. Uh, so the short of it is that uh, each line item is now reflected as a variable and the variables change every single time you roll a dice. And because of that, uh, you'll see that the total itself also changes every time you roll the dice. Now, the uh, key concept in a Monte Carlo simulation is that you're going to be uh, running the simulation multiple times, so it's uh, multiple iterations, and you're going to be tabulating all that information and looking at the resultant behavior um, rather than just a single dice roll. So we're going to do that right now, but first we need to define uh, what we're interested in. So I'm going to click this uh, as add output. So in a way, we're defining the uh, grand total. Let's just do this grand total. Uh, USD and I'm just going to say ranges. I'll explain why in a moment. Click OK and I'm going to hit run. Uh, you can of course increase the iterations. I'm just going to stick to a thousand to make it uh, quicker. And what Excel risk does is it uh, runs in the background and it will generate uh, a bunch of charts and some statistical outputs. So uh, it looks a bit like this. So where you have a probability density function and also a cumulative density function where this shows the range of outputs where this is the sort of the min this is the the max and uh, these are the percentiles that uh, the results could take uh, so for example uh, what I mentioned earlier where I say if I want a number that is uh, based on information that I've given the model that 80% of the time I'll always be below that number. Uh, I would look at this chart and I would say 80% is uh, about 4,000. So I have a slightly better way of uh, estimating the cost rather than just taking 5 and uh, that earlier number of 4.1 um, because now from a uh, this output, um, I've got a range of results. I could say that uh, from this chart, if I believe the model to be um, reflective, uh, 4.1k will be uh, a number I can choose that is uh, sufficiently uh, robust in that 80% of the time, uh, I will never go over that number. So uh, you can see this is a slight improvement compared to before because uh, if I had uh, gone with a number between 4.2 and 5, uh, you know, I would have uh, set aside more money than I actually needed to. Uh, again, all this assumes that the inputs to the model are reflective. Now, uh, we can also add other elements to the model where this example was just sort of a variability in the elements that make up a cost. Now, there are also situations where you may have potential events and uh, these are things that may or may not happen, but when they do happen, they have a uh, sort of a discontinuous discrete effect on uh, your budget. So here we've got a medical emergency, we've got a, uh, a lost baggage situation, which uh, doesn't always happen. It's only, you know, one in 10. Uh, but if it does, then uh, it'll uh, cost you some money. And uh, we'll see how this works by clicking show samples. So as you can see, none of the uh, so after a couple of clicks, you can see this risk uh, turned on in this particular iteration uh, and you have a higher number. Now, uh, this is modeled using a uh, Bernoulli uh, probability distribution for the likelihood and uh, there's another one for the impact and you're just multiplying these two to get this. Now, uh, we're going to rerun the analysis and uh, we're going to add an output here. So we're going to call this grand total. USD uh, range plus risk. And we're going to click OK. And we're going to run it a thousand times. And it produces the uh, same sort of output. 
uh, but it should be side by side now. So yes, it is side by side. And what you can see is uh, this was the first um, example that we gave where it was only the sort of line item ranges. But now with the events in place, you can see that the shape at the tail is sort of uh, longer and uh, it's probably more pronounced here where um, instead of this sort of a nice bulgy shape, you have a, a longer tail where uh, the tail of the distribution is um, is sort of stretched out and uh, you can't really make it out here but uh, this sort of tail is where that 10% kicks in. Uh, it's probably clearer to see if you were to look at uh, the um, the various percentiles where if you start looking at the 90th percentile onwards, uh, there should be a bit of a difference where you have a kick of uh, a larger number. Um, so this is a, a uh, addition to what we had before and you can take it even further where in addition to uh, risk events, you also can um, relate the line items. And what I mean by that is uh, in the earlier example, we have uh, in a way assumed that all the variables are uh, independent, meaning that when they are sampled, if we say the number is between this to this or that to that, uh, you can have a case where you have a low cost for accommodation but a high cost for a meal. Uh, or vice versa, but in practice, um, we know that uh, there's probably some sort of relationship. So say, for example, if you're staying in an expensive part of Fantasy Island, uh, you're more likely to eat in a swankier upmarket restaurant. So therefore, if this falls onto uh, the high side, uh, when you sample the distribution, it's also quite likely that the meal cost will also be on the high side. Uh, and this is not always the case if uh, you uh, run it without the this relationship. Um, so if you add in um, an effect called correlation, uh, you can sort of mimic that. And uh, by uh, assigning it a number, I've arbitrarily assigned it uh, 85%, uh, which means 85% of the time they sort of move in tandem. The correlation between uh, these two variables uh, will be forced to become 85%. Uh, I can sort of reflect that behavior. Um, and I've also uh, added a variability in the forex because we know that uh, the exchange rate is not fixed. So I've got a range here. Um, and if uh, this variable is interesting because uh, what it's doing is it's going to be uh, amplifying the effect that uh, we have from all the other variables together because uh, in a way you are dividing this number with this number. So uh, this variable becomes quite key because uh, it ends up sort of uh, um, driving uh, all the other numbers as well. So uh, with this added complexity in the model, uh, I'm going to run it again. I'm going to add the output. So I'll call this uh, grand total. USD and I'm going to say range plus risk plus correlation plus forex. It's a bit wordy, that's fine. I'm going to hit run. And what you now see is uh, in addition to uh, the tail being longer, you've also got sort of a, a, a wider distribution um, because what correlation tends to do is uh, it takes uh, something that's sort of more bunched up in the middle and spreads it out, uh, widening the sort of overall range of distribution because now the variables sort of move uh, in tandem, uh, which is a bit more reflective. And now you can uh, see for yourself the that 10% risk uh, appears to be a bit more um, um, pronounced in this uh, final version than it was earlier. Now, uh, to sort of round off, uh, this is all interesting and good, but how does this help you? So what these sort of analyses also often include sensitivity diagrams that allow you to understand uh, which factors drive the output. So uh, this chart is generated by Excel RISC automatically and it plots the correlation 
between each variable and the overall total. Total, where the longer the bar is, um, the stronger the correlation between that particular variable and the grand total. So in this particular case, uh, if you were to plot uh, all the uh, grand total values against the uh, plain fair values for each iteration, and you were to try and find a correlation between them, you end up with 0.62 uh, as the correlation between plain fair and grand total, and so on. Uh, and this uh, result kind of makes sense, because if you think about it, uh, the plain fair is uh, the element that uh, makes up a big chunk of your holiday cost. More than half of it is in uh, plain fair alone, even in the worst case, best case, a very big proportion of it is plain fair. So it stands to reason that uh, it has a very big effect on your uh, results. Um, the uh, What's interesting is the holiday uh, activity and the accommodation cost. Uh, holiday activity is slightly higher and that's probably because uh, the variability in uh, holiday uh, activity is a bit uh, larger than accommodation costs. Uh, and Forex has a negative effect. You may be wondering why the uh, effect is uh, negatively correlated, but uh, if you think about it, uh, this number is divided by the Forex number. So the bigger the Forex number, uh, the smaller the cost. So that's why it came out as a uh, negatively correlated figure. So uh, this kind of information gives you uh, insight that you can use to uh, understand where you can focus uh, on to improve your probabilistic results and reduce variability. So in this case, maybe you uh, lock in your plain fare early uh, so you don't have as much variability uh, or maybe you select where you want to stay, uh, which part of town, so that the accommodation, the meal costs sort of uh, become less uncertain. Um, and it also gives you a feel for uh, which particular risk events you want to focus on more for mitigation. So in this one, uh, medical emergency, maybe you avoid uh, bungee jumping or skydiving and uh, that should uh, reduce your likelihood. So uh, that in a nutshell is uh, how you use probabilistic risk estimates. Now uh, this example is a bit of a trivial one but the same principles are used widely in uh, a range of industries from uh, finance, investment, insurance to health and safety and uh, I've, I've also used this myself in a couple of uh, previous medium posts where example this is one where we use similar uh, Monte Carlo simulations except now we're not calculating a uh, cost of a holiday but we are trying to simulate the spread of uh, COVID-19 um, using a Monte Carlo simulation where the dots move around sort of randomly and you're doing this many many times to see what the overall results look like uh, those of you who enjoy using uh, Python, uh, I've also got a previous post where I use uh, Monte Carlo simulations as well, and you can do that um, using something called SciPy. Uh, it's a library in Python uh, where you can import a bunch of probabilistic um, probability distributions, and uh, the principles are the same. So you end up with uh, the same sort of uh, probability density function. So I hope this video has given you a um, good introduction to the topic and uh, maybe uh, you could consider using Monte Carlo simulations as well the next time you have uh, a situation where you need to make a estimate but uh, your variables tend to be uncertain and uh, somewhat random in nature. Um, till next time, uh, goodbye.